Well, good morning uh, or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I wish I wish this was uh, one of those press events that we didn't have to to do, quite frankly, but unfortunately, uh, we have to. We're, we have to speak out loudly and frequently about uh, this emerging public health crisis of heroin usage and heroin over overdoses and the deaths that uh, heroin is causing in our uh, in our community. Um, I hope I hope I'm not optimistic that this is the last time we're going to have to talk about this because we're really in the middle of something that is very uh, very alarming. Um, let me just talk a little bit about what we're talking about here. Uh, the medical ex our medical examiner who you're going to uh, hear from, Dr. Gilson, in just a moment, um, has already uh, ruled 97 cases. That is 97 deaths of friends, neighbors, coworkers, members of this community, whether it's in the city of Cleveland or suburbs, because the numbers are almost evenly divided between city and suburb. 97 uh, Cuyahoga County uh, residents uh, died because of heroin usage just so far this year. That's just coming, uh, that's just ending in the period uh, concluding on June the 30th, 2013. Uh, this is not, as I said, this isn't an urban problem, it's a community-wide problem. Uh, there were 47 heroin-related deaths in the city of Cleveland, but there were 46 in our suburban uh, communities. The projection is in 2013 that there are going to be just short of 200 heroin-related deaths. To give you some type of uh, perspective, in 2012, there were 161 heroin-related uh, deaths. If you go back uh, a little bit further in time, the numbers are even more striking. In 2007, there were only 40. In 2008, it was 64. In 2009, it was 64. In 2010, it was 90. In 2011, it was 107. Um, it was 161 last year, and it, we're projecting it's going to be up from that by the end of this year. Uh, what are we doing about it? Well, we are trying to speak out as aggressively and as loudly and as often as we can, and we're building partnerships with many of the individuals that you see here with me today. Uh, so we're trying to, uh, to create a broad coalition to in address the entire spectrum of this problem. How does it begin? And, and mostly it begins with uh, an addiction to prescription drugs. Uh, prescription drugs, particularly things like OxyContin, have become a gateway to heroin. Heroin, which for those of us uh, a little older, was kind of always viewed as, uh, a, as a drug that was only going to be used by a hardcore addict. Now this is something that people are experimenting with. And if, across a very wide age range as well, everything from high school kids uh, to, to much older individuals that have gotten addicted to prescription drugs. We're working with law enforcement, our judicial system, uh, treatment facilities, our public schools, our local colleges. We've done a few things so far. Uh, the drug drop-off boxes, which allow people to dispose of prescription drugs appropriately so that they don't get out into the distribution networks. The uh, added uh, distribution of uh, naloxone, uh, which Dr. Gilson may talk about. Uh, the medical examiner's office is highlighting uh, the way that once a, 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 a suspicious uh, uh, case comes in, that they go through a uh, heroin death review to kind of figure out what was the timeline here. How did this happen? Or were there uh, points in time when there could have been a successful uh, intervention? But there's, there's much more work that can be done uh, and should be done, and we're going to be talking about that today with our partners here. I want to, at this point, turn it over uh, to uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio, of Ohio uh, Steve Dettelbach, who's been our partner in this and many other efforts, but uh, he came to me uh, a few weeks ago, and even though we've been working on this on a continuing basis, just the numbers are just crying out for something additional to be done. The Justice Department is uh, ready to engage even more than they already have, and he'll say a few words about that. Steve? Thanks a lot. Uh, so, it's um, no problem. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, uh, the county executive uh, continues to be a leader in speaking out on this issue, and he and his staff and uh, the medical examiner, Dr. Gilson, are uh, simply fantastic in terms of forging the kind of partnerships that we need uh, to resolve and to attack this problem. Um, in my office, 
uh, Joe Pinu, who leads the, uh, the narcotics unit, and the men and women of the Northern Ohio Law Enforcement Task Force, that's the Cleveland Police, the FBI, the DEA, many of the suburban police departments work every day uh, to try and bring down heroin drug trafficking organizations that are out there in our community. Uh, and unfortunately, more and more of these cases are revolving around heroin. Uh, so one, pr one part of this solution is vigorous law enforcement. And from the sheriff to the uh, chief here, uh, law enforcement have been working overtime on this issue. And not only is this not just a city of Cleveland issue, but it's not a Cuyahoga County alone issue. This is a national and statewide program. One of the most recent heroin drug trafficking cases that uh, we took down uh, involved people in Ashtabula who were getting their uh, heroin through Detroit from Mexican cartels. And that case, uh, as so many cases do, resulted in the tragic death of a, of a mother. Uh, and the heartrending evidence was the phone call of a seven-year-old uh, who found her mother dead from an overdose of heroin in a hotel room. Uh, that case was successfully prosecuted with a death specification and uh, is uh, sentenced, is, is scheduled to be sentenced. Uh, but just as heroin dealers are more and more creative in funneling this poison into the community, we on the other side, in law enforcement and in public and civic leadership, have to be more creative about bringing together coalitions because we cannot simply arrest our way out of this problem. We are not simply going to resolve the heroin problem by arresting more and more of these drug dealers because as quickly as we snatch them up, others emerge to take their place. And that's why it's so important that we have the public health community represented here. That's why it's so important that we have the treatment community represented. That's why it's so important that we're talking about uh, the antidote, naloxone, being more available in the community to save lives. It's not any one of these things that's going to resolve this problem. It is only by an all-of-the-above approach that we're going to make headway in the heroin problem. Uh, and that is why I am very, very happy uh, to announce today that uh, partnering with the county and partnering with the Cleveland Clinic and partnering with other people in the public health community, we are going to be holding on November 21st a regional summit on the issue of heroin use. Uh, now, the summit will address issues of enforcement, but it will also address issues of treatment. It will also address issues that relate to the antidote. It will also address issues that relate to prevention of this problem. And, as uh, County Executive Fitzgerald said, the all too frequent escalation from prescription drug abuse into the world of heroin. Uh, and there's other things that are currently going on before November 21st. Uh, as uh, Ed mentioned, there is a group, a multi uh, agency group of individuals who meet and discuss how it is on a task force that we're going to prevent this problem. And included in the responses are uh, things like the county prosecutor, uh, Prosecutor McGinty, tasking his staff to respond directly to heroin overdose scenes, which is a tremendous, tremendous sea change in the way that we in law enforcement do business. And County Prosecutor uh, McGinty is doing a fantastic job of that. So the idea is is by working the problem from all these different perspectives that we can make some headway uh, in what is a, a crisis throughout Ohio. Um, so I want to end by just echoing something that, that Ed said, which is that he is so right when the number one thing we can do, the number one thing we can do is to speak out of this problem. And I want to speak to parents, teachers, youth, people out there who are at that party where somebody takes out that little baggie and asks them if they want to try something. Trying heroin might be the last mistake that you ever make. It's dangerous, and whether it's over a period of time or whether it's instantaneous, heroin is going to kill you. We just need to keep telling people that. So thank you very much for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Uh, just a couple things to follow up, and then I want to turn over to Dr. Gilson. As, uh, as uh, U.S. Attorney Dettelbach mentioned, we, we recognize that we're not going to be able to, to prosecute our way out of the problem, although um, I know I can speak for Prosecutor McGinney and Sheriff Bova, who are here today, um, as well as Chief McGrath and, and suburban police chiefs as well, is we're going to be very vigilant about this. If somebody is dealing this poison to people, uh, we're going to be very, very tough on them. Um, but 
Um, that we know from past history that we're not going to be able to completely eradicate somebody's opportunity to experiment with with heroin, and so we have to also focus on education through the through the healthcare community and through the educational community. There is no such thing as an experimentation in heroin. Uh, the first experiment might be the last experiment. Um, if you just look at and there's the human stories that that Steve mentioned that will break your heart, like a child calling 911 because their mother won't wake up and they don't understand why and the, and, and the parent is always de already dead from a heroin overdose. We know that those kind of things happen and unfortunately they're happening on almost a daily basis in this community. But the numbers also tell uh, their own story. You know, 60 percent of the drug overdoses in this community are now due to heroin. And it did not used to be that way. If you go back into, let's say you go back to about 2007, it's only about 18 percent of the fatal overdoses in this county were as a result of heroin. At that time, uh, it was more likely that somebody was going to uh, have a fatal overdose on cocaine. Now it's all the way up to 60% and it has gone up every single year. Every single year. Um, to tell a little bit more about the way we're trying to track these things, because I'm, I'm a big believer that sometimes, yeah, the human stories are important, but we also need to just get out the facts, the actual facts of what's, what are, what's happening. Sometimes government and society doesn't respond unless something is measured objectively. And to talk a little bit more about how we're trying to do that part of the equation uh, through our medical, examiner, uh, medical examiner's offices, our, uh, our medical examiner, Dr. Tom Gilson. Doctor. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for being here. It is a topic like the executive. and. Uh, U.S. Attorney said that it's really alarming and it continues to be alarming. And it was about a year ago we were here talking about our epidemic of heroin. And I think, you know, like everybody standing here, we wish we could have said we were going to turn the tide on this, but that wasn't possible. What we were able to do, though, in that short time is that we've been continuing to look at the problem and to design our responses based on that. And some of the things that we've noticed are what the county executive mentioned. This year we've had 97 deaths that were attributable to heroin either by itself or in combination with other drugs. That number is a substantial increase again from where we were last year, but it's not as dramatic as last year was over the year before. Since that time we've been able to introduce the antidote naloxone. That's a non-addictive medication that reverses the effects of heroin in any narcotic painkiller. We've had documented reversals of people who've overdosed on that since the program was introduced in March of this year through the county executive and through Metro Hospital and Dr. Papp, who's on my right. Those are people who didn't have to come to my office, so we are having some initial effect. But like has been said, it's not exactly where we want to be. Back in September of last year, when I approached the county executive about this, we decided that the formation of a task force within our opiate uh, response team to specifically focus on heroin would be a beneficial step to take. And as a result of that, we started to look at all of the deaths that had occurred in 2012 from heroin and try to track back intervention points where we might be able to stem this tide away. What we noticed, among other things, is that it's not, as the executive said, a city problem, a city of Cleveland problem. We continue to see an even division between suburbs and city of Cleveland in terms of the number of people who've died. The numbers that, I, that uh, Ed shared with you are from the first half of this year. So from January to June of this year, we had the 97 overdoses, and they're just about evenly divided between city of Cleveland and the suburbs. We still continue to see a lot of young people being overrepresented in this population, about 25%, which is the number that we saw before. We also continue to see a lot of people who overdose either with other people they're using drugs with or they're using drugs and dying in the presence of other people who aren't using drugs. This is the most telling reason why we need to continue with the naloxone distribution and potentially through House Bill 170 or other types of legislation like that to make it even more available to family members who are basically sitting you know, in another room while their loved one is upstairs dying. We're talking about June's data now here in the beginning of September because the laboratory testing for 
this kind of a death takes up to six to eight weeks. What we noticed was, again, through looking at these deaths from 2012, at least half of them had evidence of drug paraphernalia at the scene. And then they went on, that would be needles, syringes, spoons, things like that, that would tell us something was going on there. We had to give law enforcement a leg up on that, so what we tried to do, partnering with the City of Cleveland, with the Sheriff's Office and the Prosecutor's Office, was to give alerts to say, look, this looks like a drug overdose death, and gratefully they've been able to respond a lot sooner to potentially get on the trail while it's still a lot warmer than it is you know, six to eight weeks afterwards when we know for sure that it's a heroin overdose. The last thing that I really wanted to drive home is about prescription medications. The executive and the U.S. attorney touched on this. And I want to give you some numbers because I think that this is really the heart of the problem in this, you know, epidemic. When we looked at the 160 people who overdosed on heroin in 2012, within six to 18 months of their death, that's as far back as we could look through the state's drug mon prescription drug monitoring program, over half of them had a prescription for a controlled substance and most of those controlled substances were legal opiate pain relievers. Oxycodone, hydrocodone, and tramadol were the big three, and that over half of them had a prescription for a benzodiazepine. That's a sedative. So things like Xanax, Valium. That's a big problem because the gateway comes through prescription drugs. We've tried to address that over and over again. And then when we met before and we talked about prescription drug boxes, a lot of those young people who overdose on heroin get their start taking their prescription drugs from their parents out of their medicine cabinet. It's critical to get rid of those medications out of your house if you no longer need them. And it's critical as a medical community that we start to really rethink the way we prescribe medication. We don't need to be prescribing so much pain medication. Sorry, that's just something I feel very passionate about because I think that that's, we're not going to get ahead of the problem if we don't really do something more to address the way we're prescribing medication. Last thing I can say is, you know, we didn't get into the situation overnight. And while I wish that this was kind of a sprint and we were here to tell you today, it's all better. It's going to be a marathon. But I think with the response that I've seen, I'm sort of an outsider to Cuyahoga County. I've been very gratified that people have rolled up their sleeves and gotten down to work. Thanks very much. Doctor, could you just mention quickly, uh, you'd mentioned House Bill 170, uh, just <coughs> briefly, could you just quickly summarize what, what is House Bill 170 and what would it, how would it strengthen our, uh, our efforts? Right now, there are only a few communities in the state of Ohio that have even the ability to distribute naloxone. One is down in Sayota, uh, Portsmouth, Sayota County, Lorraine County just recently, and Cuyahoga County. Cuyahoga County wasn't really through the efforts of the state, it was through our county executive and Metro Hospital. What House Bill 170 will do is permit the distribution of naloxone not only to the addicts but to their families as well so that we have the antidote out there in the hands of people who potentially could use it. Can you just explain to, in previous press conferences we've talked about naloxone but just briefly explain to what explain what it is and what its utility is. Sure. Naloxone's been around for a long time. It's a medication that was used to basically reverse the effects of an opiate overdose, any opiate, be it heroin, oxycodone, hydrocodone. The chemical in naloxone acts on the same part of the brain that those medications and illegal medicines and heroin act on. And what it does is it blocks heroin from going there and causing a person to fall asleep and not wake up. And in fact, it'll bump heroin out of that receptor in the brain and wake the person up if they're getting into trouble and slipping into a coma or dying from it. It's not addictive. You can't get addicted to naloxone. It doesn't have side effects. So a person who gives it in good faith won't be hurting the person if they, even if they're not under the influence of that drug, heroin or one of the painkillers. The drug will just have no effect, essentially. But if they are under the influence, it reverses the effect of it. And I'm sure Dr. Papp sees this more than I do, but those people wake up very, very rapidly from what's a potentially a very lethal spiral down to death. Let me just uh, wrap up then by saying, uh, uh,
next time you'll see us kind of in a public setting will be this uh, in November, where, as Steve mentioned, we're going to, going to be having the summit, the Cleveland Clinic. I think it's so important to show that we have partners in the, in the medical community. It's not just a law enforcement issue. It's a social service agency, medical facilities, government, prosecutor, local government, federal government that's working in partnership here. I, I do just want to mention kind of our partners that we have up here, and then there's, if there's any questions for any of us. So uh, Chief McGrath from the city of Cleveland, Dr. Gilson, and myself from the county, uh, Steve Dettelbach from the U.S. Attorney's Office, Bill Denahan, who's here from the Adams Board, uh, Dr. Papp, who's here from uh, Metro Health, Prosecutor McGinney, and Terry Allen from the, uh, from the County Board of Health. Any questions uh, for any of us? I think you mentioned one of you mentioned actually, but I just wanted to cl clarify where exactly is this heroin coming from? I think he's probably the best. Um, so, uh, obviously, you know, uh, what I say to people sort of, you know, there's not, you know, opium is not grown in Orville, mm -hmm. poppies aren't grown in Parma. So, uh, these, these drugs come through a long, uh, circuitous route to, to our jurisdiction. Most of the heroin that we are seeing uh, comes uh, from the Mexican cartels. Uh, and that means a variety of different things. It means that it could come over the border in Mexico. It means it could go from the Mexican cartels to Canada and come down through our northern border. It means that it could uh, take a long circuitous route and come in through uh, Miami or the Caribbean. Uh, the Mexican cartels now are multi-billion dollar criminal organizations, every bit as sophisticated uh, as a legitimate uh, uh, global corporation. Uh, and they are working uh, to try and find ways to defeat uh, law enforcement efforts to interdict every day. Uh, and I, I do want to tell you that uh, for us, once it gets in the United States, we're talking about Chicago, Columbus, Detroit, and New York as sort of the major distributors. But as I just told you, they've got us surrounded north, south, east, and west. Uh, and so law enforcement has their hands full uh, trying to cut these, these things off. Uh, uh, so... Um, eh. Mexican cartels, but it's really coming from everywhere. Any other questions? Thanks for coming. We'll see you in November. Thank you.